boss. Co. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I spoke to Rose today. She's got a heap of new stuff coming in. So that's quite exciting. So we'll draw that towards the end of the evening. Um, and we have a post-work session. So something I'm really big on is going away and actually doing some work. So Penny's um, kindly donated half an hour free for a one-on-one -on -one consult for your business at the completion of um, basically getting your post-work through to her. Um, so introductions, we've got Rebecca Nind from Beef and Lamb. She's the Central South Island Extension Manager and she's doing the background um, Zooming um, and Penny. So Penny from Social License Consulting. So I suppose when, by way of introduction, is when we were thinking about, you know, our webinar for our farming for profit events, you know, there's such a focus on regulations and compliance and, and what we're, um, you know, being required to do is, is occupying all of our attention and energy. So my thoughts were how can we evolve this into an opportunity um, and what forms of opportunity are out there? So um, Penny and her business social license consulting um, stood out as one of those potential opportunities for me. So Penny's background um, before social license consulting stems from a career in strategic communications. She's a fellow farming wife and business owner and a busy mum, a very busy mum. Um, and she's here with us to share her key skills and processes um, from her toolbox she's um, collated over the years and core insights about farm businesses social license so I'll hand over to you Penny and um, drop your screen in and we can get going. Cool oh thank you Nicole um, thank you for having me um, everyone and taking time out of your evening um, I'm sure you've all got busy um, lives with children at this time of night um, and excuse if you can hear a baby crying in the background <laughs> It's not being abandoned, it's with my husband. <laughs> um, so I just thought I always am a little bit ambitious with what we try to get through. So we'll just be a bit nimble and um, see how we go. But what I wanted to cover with you guys is just an introduction to what a social license is, why it's important, um, and how you guys can use some tools to help improve yours. <clears throat> And then getting into some practical stuff. So looking at your core values, um, which is you'll find out is highly relevant to your social license. Um, and having a look at what good looks like, um, because it's good to have something to benchmark yourself against and paint that picture. And then if we're lucky and we are super fast, we can get into doing a stakeholder map. So as you guys had some really great answers to what a social license is, I'm sure you're all aware that stakeholders is a huge part of that and understanding the very broad array of stakeholders involved with a social license to operate. Um, and then just a little um, focus to wrap up on where social license is heading with the primary sector. Um, and some further steps that you can take to continue your learning um, and earning your social license with your businesses. So I thought just in context that you um, as individuals can focus on your individual business as we do the exercises and just feel free to stick your hand up and ask a question um, if I'm not making sense. So hopefully my thing will go into the next slide. There we go. So what is a social license? In essence, it's all about the humanization of your business. So it's how you treat people the way they would like to be treated. So it's taking that universal concept of treating people like you'd like to be treated to that next step and actually going, we're gonna treat them how they would like to be treated. Um, and that universal rule is important because it's the one thing that drops down barriers between um, sex, religion, politics, power, race, um, and all those things that can create division and conflict amongst societies, because that is the one thing that we can all um, draw common ground from. Uh, and for those that aren't aware, social license is measured on trust, so how much trust your business or industry has with its 
stakeholders um, and that trust is built from a, a value connection with your stakeholders it's how you've humanized your operation and engaged with your stakeholders and whether you're accountable for your actions so it's owning it when you get it wrong and being proactive and engaging with stakeholders before problems arise so it's all about building that high level of trust and it centers around being a good human as a business and that's why we spend a lot of time figuring out who we are in terms of our purpose and our values so that we can be authentic and engaging with our stakeholders to build that high level of trust and understanding of who we are um, and basically the benefit for your business and the flow on effect is getting ahead of regulations and staying in line with market cycles because you're retaining your relevance to the stakeholders that are important to your business. Um, and it's, yeah, it's all about future proofing your business. And then I'm just go to the next slide. So this weird diagram is just reinforcing that, um, essence of value alignment and that's building a connection with your stakeholders and retaining your relevance living your values um, and building your authenticity so it's actions speak louder than words um, we can all paint values and put um, pretty sayings or you know visions on our wall um, but it's those that can live it and embed it into how the organization functions and how they behave that truly have that um, high high level of trust um, and then about being accountable so allowing your stakeholders um, to build that trust with you because they know you're reliable and you'll do what you say you're going to do but also you're going to front up when you get it wrong um, and you know treat them with the respect that they deserve um, and the Sustainable Business Council defines it as a measure of confidence and trust that society has in the business to behave in a legitimate, transparent, accountable and socially acceptable way. So um, a very similar definition, but um, it's how you break it down into some practical things that you can do um, and to keep you on track because it can be pretty broad and turn into a whole lot of grey. <laughs> So um, hopefully I'll be able to break that down over this quick period um, for you guys. So I just wanted to take you through um, the different levels of social license um, and the levels of trust that you can have with your stakeholders and what it is that affords you those different levels. So withdrawal or withholding, if you move up to acceptance, you have to cross a legitimacy boundary and that is that value connection um, and that authentic behavior that basically opens the door for you to have a relationship with your stakeholders. So it's just earning that relevance and um, trying to get that airtime with them, but you're still under the watchful eye of lobby groups and NGOs and the media. Um, to go from acceptance to approval, you have to cross that credibility boundary. And again, that's about the authenticity um, and who you are and how you behave, um, but a big one in terms of being accountable as well so it's all about that good um, humanization stuff and being true to yourself and understanding who you are and then living that um, and then going from approval to a psychological identification which is a bit of a hairy one um, you have to cross, cross a full trust boundary and that is where you've created such a strong uh, sense of self or human humanized business or brand um, that your stakeholders feel a sense of ownership of your business. And I always like to use in New Zealand as an example here because they basically used their stakeholders as their brand. So New Zealanders are their brand. And it's like holding a mirror up to your stakeholders and them seeing themselves in you. And that's that value alignment and connection that you're building um, and that relevance to a point where they're really proud to use your business or um your products um, and be associated with you. Um, and an example where uh, a business has earned really high credibility and they've been pretty consistent in that space um, is Countdown. So they were first to move voluntarily to removing plastic bags from their supermarket. And in the space of a year, that action took them from, ooh, 
I think it was, um, oh, sorry, my memory's escaping me, but it was quite far down the comma front and trust index right up to 11th place in the space of just a year. And um, again, I've made some, some moves recently in that sustainability space as well. And the key there is moving before you're pushed. And that is something that the primary sector failed to do in terms of sustainability and why we've had such a big issue with social license of the past decade um, when we were confronted with um, sustainability issues and claims from some of our stakeholders. So we'll go to the next one. So with uh, the social license consulting model that, um, that I've created, I'll just run you through it to give you a broad context of what we um we are doing here today so we're in the clarity phase it's really important to understand who you are before you engage with your stakeholders um, to be able to do it authentically um, and consistently um, and for them to get a really clear idea of who you are um, and that's understanding what your vision and your why is um, so that's your purpose why is your business here why does it exist what problems are trying to solve um, the values that drive you to achieve that um, vision. So that's your vision is your why and your values are your how. Um, and that's also what you use to develop some human humanized um, characteristics for your business. So how you behave and um, what you will and won't do. And then understanding your risks. So, um, and these are all ranked and prioritized uh, to help you focus on the critical ones as well as your stakeholders. So um, we do weighted stakeholder mapping and risk matrices, which help inform you about the areas and the stakeholders that you need to prioritize first. And then you move out to the connection phase. So that's about engaging with those stakeholders, the priority ones. And it's about engaging to understand rather than engaging to be understood. So it's very much about listening and being egoless um, and understanding that your business doesn't exist without these stakeholders, whether they agree with you or not, um, and being really humble. So it's a privilege to be able to have the air of your stakeholders and especially if you can create a safe space for them to come to you with issues rather than go elsewhere and sort of form lobby groups or um, you know focus groups that can target you through the media um, in other ways so creating that humble safe space to talk behind closed doors is really important um, and then the action phase so once you've sought to um, understand it's about collaborating and being accountable and implementing changes to start to rectify some of the issues or the impacts that you're having on people that you might not have realized that you are and then the circle evolves out and we reassess what's changed um, and report back to those stakeholders and it's yeah just an evolving cycle so um, the first part of it is you know in terms of clarity is getting clear on what your vision and your values are so um, if you don't understand who you are and your purpose, um, you can lose that authenticity and ability to be consistent, which erodes trust. So what I'd like to do um, is get you guys to answer some questions. So if you have a pen and paper, um, if not, go grab one. I want you to write down at the very top, your vision is your why and your values are your how. And then I would like you to write down some questions. Um, I'll just give you a minute to go grab a pen. Hopefully you all do. So I want you to write down why are you in business? Who are you here to serve? How will you leave your environment and community in a better place than when you arrived? And how are you a part of the solution rather than the problem? For purposes of time, so we can get onto the stakeholder stuff, but as to against those questions, identify any key core values that um, have popped up for you that might be relevant 
as a result of your answers. Um, it can be helpful to just have a list of values next to you to help drive that thought process. But um, if you already have values also, just to check against what you've written down um, to see whether there's any misalignment there or so it might pay to, to rethink or have a, have a refresh on um, bridging that gap between your purpose and your values. Um, so having those um, core values to your business that help you achieve your vision is essentially like a moral compass, I guess, in terms of choosing how you get there. Um, and it, as I said before, it's the what you will not do and what you will do that help help better define those. And it also, um, not only with your external stakeholders, is a real benefit to your internal stakeholders and your staff because it gives very clear boundaries on behaviours, which comes back to that humanisation component of earning your social licence. Um, so they understand what your priorities are, um, gives confidence and clarity in how to operate um, as an employee, um, as well as um, giving that clarity to external stakeholders of, of who you are and what they're going to get when they deal with you. So there's no room for disappointment. Um, and if done well, it can be ingrained in your business so that it becomes second nature. And is it a great way of um, also helping you select who you want to work for you as well? Um, but they should be aspirational values as well. So it's pushing yourself. It's not staying in your comfort zone, um, aspiring to be better every day. And that's the same with your, your vision and your purpose too. Um, so we'll move on to what good looks like. Um, so your social license when you're running, um, in high flow, I guess, is a business that is engaged and is about being brave. So that comes back to that owning it when you get it wrong part and creating safe space to bring people in that uh, disagree with you or have very different values um, to you and not being afraid to engage with that and look at where you might be able to meet them in the middle um, and compromise. Uh, so consulting is also um, in line with what I was just talking about. So that's being inclusive of lots of people with very different views because um, as we know around the boardroom table or any, any sort of group that's helping on a project, you want diversity, right? If you surround yourself with people that all think the same as you, you um, are opening yourself up to business risks of um, becoming irrelevant or being blindsided by a side of community that um, disagrees with you that doesn't feel like they've been heard or included um, so empowering as well so giving ownership to um, different levels of stakeholders as well as um, different types again those ones with different views, very important not to exclude them. Um, and also the ones that you impact, the ones that you have the biggest impact on are the ones that need to be included and feel empowered to have a say because um, they're the ones that can quickly turn into disgruntled stakeholders. Um, and then acting, so that accountability and integrity of your business. So doing what you say you're going to do, being transparent and um, owning it when you get it wrong and fronting up before being pushed. Uh, so um, examples of that is, um, I mean, bigger businesses are getting into that integrated reporting, um, transparent reporting, um, going to that extra level of detail about declaring their ambitions um, and reporting against those in terms of sustainability and, um, social, so how they're looking after their people as well, um, and pay equity and things like, like that, um, going above and beyond basically and reporting that to uh, a broader set of stakeholders. And then it's the empathy, which is a huge one. So being respectful of the impact that you have um, on your stakeholders and having empathy with those that feel like you've um, let them down and not brushing that off. Uh, so just having that really high level of empathy and then the follow through. So consistency, 
uh, and this comes back to that values and purpose piece, being consistent in your behavior and the direction that you're heading and not giving stakeholders a different version of yourself every time they engage with you. So that's very crucial when it comes to staff, um, especially. And all of that adds up to humanization. So I just constantly bring it back to your business needs to be a good human. Um, and then when you think about stakeholders, I like to talk about them as a family. So defining the different levels of stakeholders by a, a type of um, version of your family. So you've got siblings, parents, children, cousins, et cetera, because at the end of the day, we're all people um, and we all want to be treated with respect and empathy. Um, and if we can, I know that sounds very simple, but if we can keep it at that simple level, it just keeps keeps us honest um, because we can overcomplicate things with um, business and economics and politics but if we can just keep reminding ourselves that we're all human um, it keeps us very clear on um, what we need to do to build trust and have a high level of social license um, so some benefits of investing in earning your social license and um, building trust with your stakeholders is that you're going to create brand preference. So 71% um, of consumers prefer buying from brands that align to their values and have a higher brand purpose. So that's being a part of the solution rather than the problem. Um, nobody wants to be seen or feels good about supporting businesses that are a part of the problem or eroding our environment or our society or our economy. Um, so it actually earns businesses a, a, a premium. You know, we've got premium products in the market who are solely based off serving the greater good and leaving the environment in a better place than it was when they started. There's a whole whole new market um, coming out around health and well-being as well um, but environmental um, products and sustainability products are a huge huge market now um, just because businesses have cottoned on to the fact that they can make more money from being a part of the solution rather than the problem um, and yeah that brand preference so standing more for more than your bottom line earns you that stakeholder preference or consumer preference um, and future-proofing your business. So if you understand who your stakeholders are and what they value and what's important to them, you can preempt their needs so that you can save your resources or prioritize your resources for things that are going to be accepted and supported by them. Uh, and that's you know just about retaining that relevance. Um, I'm just going to the next page. So before we get into this next exercise, which is a stakeholder mapping exercise, um, just an example of a business that's earning a high, or well, has earned a high level of social license over in Oz is Austral Fisheries. So um, this is again back to that environmental market that's um, booming at the moment. They created the first carbon neutral fish um, and that earned them a 13% premium in the in the open market um, with that product. Um, they also partnered with Sea Shepherd uh, to uh, help them on a mission to stop pirate fishes in the Australian waters and very unlikely partnership as well. So again, it comes back to those with very different views and they've usually, the fishing industry sits opposite uh, Sea Shepherd, but in this case, very out of character, they partnered with them to be a part of the solution, which also benefited their business in an economic sense because um, it reduced uh, the load in terms of fish take from their, their waters. Um, but things like that, there's stuff in the media all the time about rare partnerships like that, like W, um, is it the World Wildlife Fund, WWF, they partnered with a fishing business in New Zealand as well to uh, stop bird catch. And previously before that, they had been at loggerheads over the issue. Um, so there's really cool things popping up all the time where opposing sides are starting to work and collaborate together to fix the problem rather than um, waste their time and energy fighting each other. So 
this stakeholder map that I've got in front of you, if you wanted to jump back into your pen and paper mode and copy it down, um, you don't have to do it exactly like the circles, you can just do it in a grid format. Um, what we're going to do is identify your core direct, indirect and emerging market stakeholders for your business. And we're going to base it, if you can see weak, medium and strong on the outside, that's the strength of the relationship that you have with them on this day. So we define core stakeholders and I'll pop this into the chat as um, a group person or business that your business cannot function without um, and whose livelihood is directly reliant on your business. So in terms of bringing it back to that humanization component, this would be your children. Um, so they're heavily reliant on you to live. Uh, and then your direct stakeholders is a group person or business that enables you to function and operate. So they provide you services um, and resources or access um, to land to enable your business to function. So um, in terms of a human component to that, I would say that or arguably it could be your partner or husband or wife, or you could put them in core, um, or it could be your parents. Um, and then an indirect, a group personal business that enables you to go to market or is peripheral to your business. So they may just have interests in your operation. So that could be like your cousins. Um, and then emerging market or grandparents. Um, and then your emerging market is the future and potential customers or stakeholders um, to your business. So they don't exist yet. So they could be your grandchildren or something like that, depending on how old you are. Um, so I'll type those in and then remembering to classify them, whether you've got a terrible relationship with them, medium can also mean not sure uh, or strong. So we'll give you a bit longer to do this one as well. Um, so the next step, I won't play you this video because we won't have time, but it is a great, and I can provide the link to Nicole uh, afterwards or Rebecca. Um, it's a great video defining what great stakeholder engagement is all about. Um, and it reiterates that whole point that I've been driving home about humanization of businesses um, and how they engage and consider their stakeholders. Um, just looking at next steps of where social license um, is heading. So you guys may be aware of uh, that class action against all birds over in New York in terms of their sustainability claims. Um, and it just re iterates the importance of being aware of greenwashing. Um, it's not a new term um, and people's tolerance or suspicion of it has only been increasing over the years as people have cottoned on to the fact that um, environmental you know, practices or claims in businesses can help um, improve your market share um, and preference with consumers. So what is coming out of that is more and more lawsuits against businesses. So there's a whole legal um, precedent that's being set at the moment. Um, thankfully with the all birds thing, that um, suit was dismissed recently. And, um, but it doesn't really uh, sort of help all birds in terms of the fact that the, the media saga had already played its way out in the public. So the perception or the damage to their brand um, had already happened. And I think the primary sector are really well versed on knowing that um, regardless of the facts, once the issue is being played out with lobby groups in um, the media, um, the harder it is to uh, argue your point and have meaningful dialogue with those stakeholders that um, are upset with your behavior or they have misunderstood practices of your business and have rather than coming to you behind closed doors have you know gone straight to the media so the damage can already be done whether you're right in the right or the wrong um so that was really unfortunate for all birds who are a great business um and brand for new zealand um so be really aware of um 
you know, the fact that sustainable and environmental claims is a bit a lot of self-regulation going on in that space and is reliant on businesses um, being accountable and being above board with their claims. Um, and with that comes growing cynicism uh, and intolerance with uh, the public and, and especially in the media as well. So um, my view is that with social license, it's better to talk about what you're doing wrong. It sounds really weird, but people are far more trusting of people that can talk about their flaws and what they're doing wrong and that will take the good with the bad than people, um, as I said before, getting pretty cynical about those that are shouting from the rooftops about how great they are, especially in New Zealand where we um, are famous for the tall poppy syndrome. Um, but if you can mix the good with the bad, uh, you are going to be on a far more level head um, and keep your... Um, keep your business out of the, the media radar, um, so to speak. So this map here is more about next steps. So just to talk about the social license uh, process and the tools that we use at Social License Consulting. So this would be where you would take, and this is where you go in the draw to win the prize um, in that extra session with me is whoever can fill this out first. So what you do is you transfer the stakeholders from that first map over into this one. And it's based off your perception currently of the level of influence and interest that those stakeholder groups have in your business. Um, and then you have the, the weighting or the ranking of those stakeholders is defined by the strength of the relationship. So um, threes would go next to weak stakeholders and ones with strong uh, and two with medium and essentially how that um, helps you identify and prioritize stakeholders is that if you're looking at the top right corner which is your priority stakeholder group if you've got any threes in there that's a real problem uh, but you should you should tend to if you're on the money have a lot of ones there but this is just a uh, point in time. This is evolving all the time. Businesses, relationships and priorities change um, as they get better at things and new issues pop up. Um, so don't panic if there is one there because one, it's awesome that you've identified it and you can do something about it, but it may just be a point in time where things um, there's a particular issue going on at the moment that um, you're working on. And um, yeah, so you'll see that there's different um, definitions of what type of engagement once you put those stakeholders into those boxes is required. And this is all about uh, making um, the elephant edible. You know, you, how do you eat elephant? It's one bite at a time um, so that it's not completely overwhelming because working on your social license is a huge investment of time and resource. So um, yeah, starting with that top right box is always a good place good place to start and help help get your head around it um, and then move on to the other groups as um, as you go so involve and engage would be your next level of priority uh, and also just feel free to get in touch afterwards if you have any more questions around around that um, and then I'll just go into refresh your memory on what this is all for so this is, again, it's just part of that clarity phase. So there's um, stakeholders, values, vision and why. And then there's another component that we haven't talked about, which is your business risks. So that's addressing your three pillars of sustainability, mainly. So your environmental, social and economic risks to your business and um, the likelihood of those happening and the cost to your business. So that's helping inform your stakeholder engagement strategy in terms of um, the weaknesses of your business and where you're most vulnerable. Um, and then that is me. I'll just refresh you on social license. So hopefully it's very clear that um, social license earning it is all about humanizing your business and how it operates and engages with your stakeholders. Um, and that's about building that value connection or value alignment and living your values authentically, you know, actions speak louder than words and being accountable and transparent with your stakeholders as well. 
So thank you very much. Hopefully that wasn't too much all in one go. Um, awesome. Yeah. Thanks, Penny. Let's right. uh, mute or pop it in the chat box. Um, it's it's been awesome and thought provoking um, from uh, my own business um, sense, but also looking from a farmer's perspective as well. And I suppose it screams to me like an integrated farm planning um, approach. And we're sort of starting on that journey where it's it's a compliance figure, but that you know we we can drive that one step further to add value to our business as well. So. Um, Kerry's just asked a question. Can we drop back to that grid? Um, we've got a couple of things. Um, obviously, that homework, um, if you're really engaged in this space and want to jump in, um, flicking that homework through to Penny and going into the draw for that half an hour um, extra consult. Um, and also, we've got a random price draw for those that attended today, which is awesome. Um, and that goes to Laura Bunning. Um, is the winner of that. So, Laura, if you get in touch um, or hang on at the end of this presentation, we'll organise um, that to be sent out to you from uh, Two Roads Gift Boxes, which is awesome. Mm-hmm.